It's TV school time. WOY TV, in association with Iowa State Teachers College, presents another program in the Iowa TV School Time series, Landmarks in Iowa History. Today's topic is Corning. Your teachers are Herb Hake and Leland Sage of Iowa State Teachers College. Hello, boys and girls. Have you ever seen a building like this? Of course you have. That's a country school. There are thousands of buildings like this all over Iowa. This one has been boarded up. It's no longer being used, just as there are other rural schools, country schools, which are boarded up now. But in appearance, this is very much like thousands of other country schools all over the state. There is one important difference, though. This school at one time was used by children of communists. Yes, sir. The parents of these children were communists. They didn't call themselves communists. They were called Icarians. And they weren't the kind of communists that live in Russia today, but they were communists in the true sense of the word. And we're going to hear the story of the Icarians who had this colony near Corning. And I'm sure you'll find the story very interesting. The story about how Icaria was formed, how the Icarian colony was settled, and how the Icarian idea got started in the first place is going to be told by my good friend, Dr. Leland Sage, who is a professor of history at the Iowa State Teachers College and who has learned a great deal about the Icarians in his studies, and he has taught about the Icarians in his classes. So he's going to tell you how the Icarians started and how they came to this country and why they came to Iowa. Will you do that, Dr. Sage? Yes, Mr. Hey, gladly. Icaria existed, or rather originated, in the mind of a French author, a very interesting French philosopher named Etienne, or as we would say, Stephen Cabet, C-A-B-E-T, who way back in the 1840s was uh, very much concerned over the problem of making a living and the distribution of property, and who felt that the economic system that was then in existence which had been brought in pretty much by the Industrial Revolution, was very unfair and that it worked hardships on a very large number of people. And Cabet was only one man back at that time who thought a great deal about this problem. Many of them wrote different books on the subject. Cabet is one of the most famous of these men. His book was called Voyage en Icarie, or Travels to Icaria, a purely imaginary land in which uh, a sort of idealistic economic and social system was uh, imagined by Cabet. And this was a system in which the state would control everything. Every man would work according to his ability, and goods would be distributed according to need. This meant that the state had to give all the orders. Somebody would have to, and in, in this uh, plan, the state would uh, give the orders. The state, in this case, was represented by a dictator named Icar, who gave the orders to the Icarians. Now, strange as it may seem, a great many Frenchmen read this book, and they decided that they would like to carry out an experiment. They would like to prove that people could live according to this plan, and that life would be better under such a plan. They were looking for a utopia, very much of the sort that Sir Thomas More had written about back in the 16th century, and which Plato wrote about in the fourth century BC. So these people, calling themselves Icarians then, uh, raised some money, 
came over from France to America, hoping to find some isolated place in which they would be free to start from scratch and work out this, uh, com this experiment in communal or communistic living, in which all property was held in common. And they came first all the way across the Atlantic, all the way to New Orleans, and from New Orleans, they came up the Red River, first the Mississippi, of course, then the Red River, uh, to Shreveport. Then from there, they disembarked and uh, came by ox wagons, ox-drawn wagons, out here about 300 miles in the northeast Texas. And there, they lived for nearly a year, trying to plow the land, sow and cultivate crops and building houses and in general trying to make this experiment work out. There were so many things against them though. The weather, the uh, diseases of this area, the uh, climate was really ferocious from their point of view. And after some 10 or 11 months of this, they gave up and came back Freeport and back down to New Orleans, and there they were joined by the founder of this experiment, this, the originator, Cabet himself, who had come across from France. And now they came all the way up the Mississippi to Nauvoo, Illinois. Remember, this is 1848 that we're talking about, and this was just two years after the Mormons had vacated Nauvoo and had come across into Iowa and on across Nebraska and out to Utah. Well, these people lived at Nauvoo for a while, and on this new map now, we'll call this point Nauvoo, just a little above Keokuk, across the river though. And then they came across the Mississippi and across southern Iowa, out here to Corning, Iowa. And here they arranged to get, they thought, about 3,000 acres of land. Actually, it turned out to be 1,000 acres, which they later increased to 1,700. And here they w undertook to carry out this experiment again, the same one they had tried and which had failed in Texas. And uh, so for something like well, this was uh, 1860 when they came here, actually, although their advance agents had come in 1853 and 54. And so that's something of the story, Mr. Hake, as to how these people got here. Thank you, Dr. Sage. <coughs> Let's remove this map. <coughs> and I want to show you something of the arrangement of the colony, which was established here near Corning. As Dr. Sage told you, these people believed in owning everything in common. They believed in having common property. No individual could have money of his own. When he joined the Icarians, he had to give up all his possessions, and he had to wear a special uniform. In the case of the women, it was blue calico dresses. In the case of the men, it was blue jeans. And perhaps that's how the idea of blue jeans got started in Iowa. But all of the personal possessions had to be turned in to the treasurer of the Icarian colony. And then they had their meals together, and this treasurer would buy the food, and the members of the colony had no personal possessions at all. They owned everything in common. And in the first colony, <coughs> the central building was a long log structure which was divided into eight rooms. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And of course, each one of these had its own door. This end room here was the laundry. And the women did all the washing. The next room was the bakery. And the men did all of the baking and cooking. Because you remember, these were French. And the French have always prided themselves on their skill in cookery. And men 
have usually been better cooks in France than women. So when the Icarians came to the New World and set up their own colony, the men did the cooking. The next room here was reserved for the water supply. And there was a big tank in there in which the water was stored. <coughs> the next room was the kitchen. And the men also took turns working in the kitchen. The next room was a common dining room. And all the Icarians ate in this one room. Families would have their own tables, but all the members of the colony ate their meals in this one big dining room. This next room was a place for provisions, groceries. But this was not a grocery store, that is, the members of the community could not go to this room and buy groceries because they had no money. The groceries were just stored in this room, and the treasurer paid for them. And then when the men in the kitchen needed something for preparing the meals, they would go to this room and check out whatever food they needed. That was then the grocery room. The next one was used for drugs. Medicines were kept there in case people got sick. And this last room was the library. The Icarians were all serious students. And they had over a thousand books that they kept in this library because they had a regular reading program for the improvement of their minds. Up here in this corner, there was a combination saw and flour mill. And as they made their lumber and their flour in the same place. Not with the same machinery, of course, but I imagine some sawdust got into the flour once in a while. Then there was another building up here for the chickens. Chickens still live in a state of communism all over the state of Iowa. Here was the horse barn. And then the road ran past the colony in this direction. And on the other side of the road, there was a, a shed for sheep, another one for cows, and another one for geese. Down here, there was the shop where wooden shoes were made, because the early settlers in Icaria wore wooden shoes. And here was the blacksmith shop. And here was a sewing shop where the women did all the sewing of the uniforms for the members of the colony. And then there were smaller houses like this in which the families lived. They could be fairly small because they didn't have to have a kitchen or a dining room. These were the homes for the families. And then there was an orchard in here. Well, this worked fine and dandy for a time. And then the younger members of the community said, look, we're getting a little bit away from the ideas of Cabay. You older folks all have gardens beside your homes. And the vegetables that you grow in these gardens are not being put in the common treasury. You're using those for yourselves. And the younger people said, that isn't right. Those vegetables should all go into the common treasury. Couldn't be used by the individual families. And the older people said, well, long ago when we lived in France, we had our own little gardens where we raised our flowers and we raised some vegetables and they were for our own use. But the younger people said, no, you can't do that. All these things should go together. But the older people would not give up their little gardens and so the younger people decided they would set up their own colony. And some of the houses were moved a short distance away to another place. And that became the new Icarian colony. The older people still stayed in the place where they had originally settled. But the newer people set up a new colony. And the new colony was arranged a little bit differently than the old the road. The main building was a big dining hall which had the colony print shop on the top. This was the kitchen. Here was the dining hall. And then right in back of the dining hall, there was a, a planting of trees. 
and this was a kind of a recreation park. And right in the center of this recreation park, they had a tall flagpole with an American flag on it because the Icarians were very patriotic citizens. And then the houses for the individual families were built on the sides of this park and in line with the front of the dining hall. And some of these smaller buildings were used for blacksmith shops and harness shops. And there was a horse barn back here. And the cemetery was over in this direction, off that way. Then there was a vegetable garden over here, and these younger Icarians believed in planting a vegetable garden, and then all the vegetables would go into a common fund. The schoolhouse in front of which we're standing today was located right here. Now let me show you how the two colonies looked when we put them together. You see, the, the old colony was toward the northwest, and there was a bend in the road, and the schoolhouse was almost halfway between the two colonies, and the new colony was toward the southeast. That's the way they were arranged. Well, of course, there is no Icarian colony here in the Corning area anymore. And I think it would be interesting if Dr. Sage told you why the Icarian community is no longer here, what happened to it, and why it was discontinued. Would you do that, Dr. Sage? Yes. <coughs> this colony went through a great deal of difficulty. Life is never as easy as it would seem under these uh, arrangements because there's always dispute as to what belongs to whom and, and so on. Well, finally, the members of one of these colonies, the old colony, uh, broke away entirely and decided to move out to California, where they soon abandoned the entire experiment. The other group stayed on here at Corning until uh, 1895. At that time, they had uh, simply come to the end of, the, of their faith and the end of their belief, rather, in this whole idea. And uh, they decided to break it up and to go into uh, the plan of individual ownership. So they went to court and they had a receiver appointed and uh, the court ordered the dissolution of this whole colony and uh, all the property was surveyed and each person in the colony received his proportionate share of the land and of the rest of the property. And uh, so from 1895 on, uh, the survivors simply lived there and uh, lived like any other ordinary American people. Well, how uh, did I carry a compare with a manor? Well, a manor, which was begun in Iowa at about the same time, uh, survived a full generation after the Icarian dissolution. The Amana colony did not uh, privately incorporate until 1932. And uh, at that time, it was a, a rather interesting thing, though. The, the young people in the Amana colony were the ones who wanted to break up the colony. In the Icarian community that we've just been talking about, it was the young people who wanted to go back to the pure uh, idealism of the founder. Well, the Amana colony went through the same experience exactly. They had a receiver appointed. The court ordered the dissolution of the colony, the Amana colony, and all of their property was surveyed, and each individual received his share. But why did Amana last longer than I Well, carry we think that this was because the Amana people had a, a different motivation from the very first. Their, theirs was a purely religious motivation. They were, they thought, pleasing God by living according to this plan of common ownership. Whereas the Icarians were simply a more self-centered and materialistic people who had, had simply abandoned capitalism in favor of this form of communism uh, simply as a means of getting better distribution of property. They had no thought about whether this pleased God or anybody else, just so long as it gave them 
the better standard of living, they thought, through a better distribution of property. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we think that this illustrates the difference between the people who live by a faith and those who simply live by a man-made philosophy. All right. Thank you, Dr. <coughs> Sage. Now, last summer, I took some pictures of the landmarks of Icaria that still remain in this area near Corning. This old barn here is the only thing that is left of the old colony of Icaria. This was at one time the dining hall, and the only surviving member of the Icarian colony who is still living near Corning told me that he could remember when they used to have dances in this building. In the evenings and on Saturdays and sometimes on Sundays, this would be a recreation hall. And he said one Saturday night they might have a dance there and the following Saturday night they would have the performance of an opera. And I said, you mean a, a real opera with singers and orchestra? And he said, yes, sir. Remember, we all spoke French and we brought to this country the things that we enjoyed in the old country. And so there were performances of such operas as Manon and Faust and other French operas right here in this old barn. Of course, it's uh, fallen into, into decay now. It's not as sturdy a building as it was in the old days, but this is all that is left of old Icaria. Here is another view of the schoolhouse near which we are standing today. I took this at a little greater distance because at the time I took this picture last summer, there were a lot of bees around this schoolhouse. I suppose they thought that since the children weren't using it anymore, they'd uh, go to school here and be unmolested. And when I came a little close, they objected. So I stayed way off. This is the old schoolhouse. And this is an interesting landmark because in this building, there was the first electric telephone in the state of Iowa. The teacher in this school had one telephone in here and the other one was in his house some distance away. And I suppose if he stayed in school grading papers a little longer than he should, his wife could call him on the telephone and say, why aren't you home? Supper's getting cold. And he'd say, all right, dear, I'll come right home. And he would. That's the value of a telephone, you see. So the first electric telephone in Iowa was installed in this old Icarian schoolhouse. Here is the only building that is left of the new colony. This was the dining hall, a two-story building. This part here on the first floor was the dining hall. The kitchen was here. And upstairs here, there was the colony print shop where the newspaper was printed. This house is now occupied by Mr. and Mrs. Townsend and their family, a thoroughly up-to-date and progressive farmer. And he's remodeled this house so it is suitable as a home. And here is the old cemetery where the pioneers of Icaria lie buried. There's no road to this cemetery. I had to drive across a wheat field to get there. And after I got there, the bottom of the station wagon was covered with wheat straw. And there was such a thick mat of it that uh, I had to pull it out when I got back to the highway. And the weeds here are quite tall. And the man who showed me where the cemetery was is the only living member of the Icarian community who is still living in Iowa. This is Mr. Jules Gentry, or as it would be pronounced in French, Jules Gentry. He was the last director of agriculture for the new Icarian colony. That is, he told all the men what they would do in the way of farming, how the vegetables would be raised, how many beans would be planted, how many potatoes, and then he supervised all this. He was the last director of agriculture in the Icarian colony. And we broke down a lot of the weeds so that I could take this picture. And here is a tombstone of one of the pioneers in the Icarian colony. Now, Dr. Sage told you about the general plan of life in Icaria that all property was to be owned in common. 
and that everyone would benefit according to his need. That meant that no individual could go out and make some money on his own in case he decided he needed a new suit. He couldn't earn the money for it. He would just tell the head of the society, the Icarian community, my suit is getting thin, I need a new suit. And so the women of Icaria would prepare a new set of blue jeans for him. And in a way, that was very handy. You never had to worry about clothes. You never had to worry about food. But of course, you could save no money for yourself. All your needs were met by the community at large. You owned nothing. And you shared in common with everyone else. And so the money all the resources of the community were put together in a common treasury. And I suppose we could let that represent the common treasury, a big bag of money. As new converts came into Icaria, they turned over their money, their jewels, their fine clothes if they had any, any property they might have, they turned it all in to the head of the community. And then they were given a costume, just like every other costume. It's almost like going into a monastery. When you enter a monastery, you must give up all your worldly possessions. And then you get a robe, just like all the other monks have, and you live a life of poverty. But of course, your needs are met. You get your food, you get your clothing, and all of your physical needs are met by the society as a whole, by the community. And in this case, it was the Icarian community. But you remember also that Dr. Sage said that the community did not last very long because it was based only upon this political theory of sharing everything in common. And the matter of religion was not very seriously considered by the members of the Icarian community. And religion, as in the case of the people in Amana, was a very important thing to ensure stability and the continuing of the community and the tradition in which it had been founded. So because the people in Icaria did not have religion to hold them together, the community failed and finally it was dissolved. And so we may think of the people of Icaria as people who were very sad, they were disappointed because their great dream had not been fulfilled. And we think of them as growing old and feeling a great deal of disappointment because the plan of Cabe, which seemed so fine, had come to no final good. So here is the old man, a survivor of a wonderful dream which Cabet had described in his book. Next week, we are going to Guttenberg, a German community on the Mississippi River, which took its name from the inventor of movable type, Gutenberg. And the people who settled the community thought they were giving it that name. But somebody misspelled it, and it became G-U-T-T-E-N-B-E-R-G, and is known as Guttenberg. That's a very interesting story, and I hope you'll be with me next week when we visit Guttenberg. Until then, goodbye. Today, your teachers have been Herb Hake and Leland Sage of Iowa State Teachers College. Landmarks in Iowa History is produced for Iowa TV School Time by WOY TV in association with Iowa State Teachers College. TV School Time is presented daily Monday through Friday at 1.30 p.m. by the Iowa Joint Committee for Educational Television.